Guys, it's Ian. Gunji Howdy. this. <laughs> um, so Ian, can you see the chat? Yes, I can. Okay. So why don't you, do you want to just run that and, you know, answer questions? And do you want to talk, I guess, I'm sure people are going to have questions pretty quickly, but, you know, just to talk a little bit about who you are as a person. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if you don't know who I am, I run a YouTube channel called Forgotten Weapons. Um, I am predominantly interested in unusual experimental prototype uh, firearms, in particular, unusual mechanical systems, uh, generally speaking, dating from the beginning of the cartridge period. So approximately 1850s to basically the present day. Um, Ashley and I did a presentation last year um, at the in-person symposium about the the difference of approaching this sort of from an edutainment versus an academic um, basis and I thought that was that was fun I appreciate being back again this year I figured uh, I'm on the like the far west coast so it's not quite lunchtime for me yet so I figured while well, you guys are having lunch we can kind of having a have a rolling discussion on whatever subjects are of interest uh, to folks who are here I will start off by just saying carbine 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 Carbine. <laughs> carbine. Yes, definitely carbine. <laughs> and regarding ATF, do not ask questions you do not want the answers to. I think that's just <laughs> a, a good rule of thumb. All right, let's see what we've got in here. Do, 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 do. Will I make it to the Springfield Armory National Historic Site? Yes, I very much hope so. Um, I had a chance to chat with those folks uh, at last year's symposium, in fact, and they're fantastic people. Um, really the best way for me to explain it to a lot of people is like if we were in europe me going to springfield would be the equivalent of like being based in spain and traveling to ukraine like it's like three thousand miles away for me so east coast stuff takes a little bit more planning and travel and everything but i absolutely will be getting to springfield and i'm looking forward to it quite a lot um yes as jonathan said uh we we're supposed to be at springfield right now, but that obviously didn't happen. So, uh, let's see. How did they get rid of the stoners? I, uh, a lot of them got crushed. Um, there are a lot of piles of crushed stoner parts out there uh, when the Navy disposed of them in what had to be the early mid seventies. Um, there are more, legal receivers out there that were manufactured, but I think the handicap at this point is that there are no remaining parts available to build out those receivers into live guns, uh, or at least very few parts. Oh, oh, what is my favorite museum slash collection to work with? That's a dangerous <laughs> question to answer in this, in this crowd. <laughs> Actually, to be honest, what I found is kind of every museum is a little bit different, um, not in a good, bad way, but in a how, what's the best way to interact with um, given museums. So I've had a lot of, as, as a general rule, curators and the folks who actually are hands on with the collections have been fantastically helpful and cooperative. It's all of the other layers of the museums that um, require attention. So um, there are some museums that have a lot of bureaucratic overhead that you have to get into and a lot of forms and a lot of, um, you know, I have to have 12 different pieces of insurance all set up in a line before I'm allowed to set foot in the building. Um, and there are some museums that are a lot more independent uh, where the curators have a lot more personal access to stuff. So I've had some where I walk in the front door and the curator basically just drags me into the back catalog, back collection and starts throwing open vault doors and, you know, hey, take a look at whatever you want. And somewhere um, I have to be much more specific about what it is that I want to examine well in advance of showing up. Um, some of that is based on how guns are stored. Um, I've been to one particular museum where they used to have a ton of stuff on display and they now have very few firearms on display. And what they did uh, was take the guns off display and basically just stuff them into a bunch of lockers. And so finding something in their reserve, which is now most of their collection, is a matter of like, look it up in the spreadsheet and try and figure out which of the identical lockers it's in. And then you open that up and you have to literally kind of like dig through all the rifles or, or guns to find it in the back. Um, and generally curators of those places are 
are very apologetic about the state of the collection, but they do their best to, to get stuff out. Um, I think everyone likes to see the collection used for what a museum is supposed to be, which is educating people. And so even if it takes a lot of headache to go through, being able to pull stuff out and put it on video and, and educate the public about it, to my mind, that's the primary aim of a museum. And while not all the administrators may share that, uh, the, the hands-on collection, I know there, there are a couple specific terms and curator is not always the best one, but the people who, have, who are actually uh, most directly interested in the artifacts are generally very excited to be able to get stuff, the attention that it may not otherwise get. The future of gun manufacturing is an interesting question. Um, it will, I think, always, well, the problem that I see uh, in terms of gun manufacturing as opposed to a lot of other manufacturing is that people, both uh, recreational shooters and militaries have very, very high standards for reliability and interchangeability and a very low tolerance for anything going wrong. And that makes it very difficult for a small or new operation to successfully manufacture a gun for a commercial or military market. And we see that a lot of times when a small company will come out with some novel idea and the first ones off the line all have some problems. And especially in today's you know, instantaneous communication age, that can sink a company very quickly um, where it's not uncommon to see a firearm take a five or 10 year development cycle to be really properly effective. Frankly, if you look at the classic Mauser bolt actions, they went through nearly a decade of actual commercial production, slowly improving and refining the design before it became the model of 1898 that was kind of a world standard. Small companies just don't have, generally, don't have the, the financial uh, or industrial wherewithal to do that. So I think on a military scale, manufacturing will always be large companies. But then the other trick is, the other, the other concern of it is militaries are not constantly buying guns. They tend to buy a bunch of guns in a big lump and then they're done for a while. And so it's not something that can sustain necessarily a large manufacturing company. And for that reason, historically, we see a lot of gun companies transition back and forth into other areas of manufacture. If they're not able to survive in a commercial marketplace, and a lot of the U.S. the big foundational um, gun companies were able to sell equally on the commercial and military markets, like Winchester, Remington, Colt, Smith and Wesson. Today, worldwide, there's a bit less of that, especially for modern uh, modern firearms. And so, I think it'll be interesting to watch um, what companies are able to pivot between. <laughs> It used to be bicycles and typewriters and motorcycles. And today, honestly, I'm not sure exactly what. It'll be interesting to see what companies bounce back and forth with. Uh, aren't I working on a book about 20th century craft produced Chinese pistols? Uh, so yes, I am in the process of doing a book. It's half catalog, half reference book. Um, there's not a lot of information on these, but I'm working on a book on Chinese domestic pistols from the warlord era, uh, which would be 1911, the Chinese revolution through 1949, the end of the Chinese civil war, kind of with its peak in the twenties and early thirties. And that that's a period where we get a lot of really unusual, often literally one of a kind firearms um, that were being manufactured by very, well, everything from very small, you know, two, three man sorts of traveling shops up through legitimate factories uh, in China, but factories that were predominantly making larger weapons. So um, Patrick here asks like where those all come from. Um, the book is based on one particular very large collection of a couple hundred of them that I was able to get access to but I've supplemented that with a couple other smaller collections to try and round it out and make sure that I've got some context and that the one main collection doesn't have a lot of anomalies in it for whatever reason. Um, so what's fascinating to me about these is that the manufacturing techniques are really kind of totally alien to what we see in the West, where if you want to make a quality gun, you set up a production line and you make a whole bunch of them and they're all identical. Uh, or even if you're making a small number of them, if they're handmade, 
boutique uh, revolvers or whatever. They're all going to be identical except for whatever custom, you know, you'll change the barrel length if a customer wants that or change the type of grips. But we really emphasize repeatability um, and having everything the same. And for this period in China, there was a very different sort of take on what, what was needed. So um, the large scale manufacturers would typically be set up to make rifles. And there are probably half a dozen major Chinese arsenals during this period that did this. And so they would get an order from a provincial military, a warlord, uh, who would say, hey, like I need 10,000 bolt action rifles and 50 pistols because they didn't, the pistol was well, like it is, well, maybe not today, but like it was in the militaries at that time, the pistol was not a particularly important uh, weapon. You know, pistols were a, a symbol of office for officers, a status symbol. Most guys did not have a pistol. And so an order would contain a lot of rifles and just a handful of pistols. And so the factory would set up a full-scale production line for rifles, and they would, in fact, be interchangeable and sequentially serial numbered. And, and well, most of them have not aged well because they were put through a tremendous amount of heavy use and poor maintenance. You can tell that these were factory-produced rifles, generally. But that 50 pistols for the order, well, it's not worth setting up the tooling and the jigs and the fixturing and everything to make... 50 pistols. So what the factories would do, as best I've been able to determine, is they would take some of their better machinists and basically say, all right, you five guys, each of you make 10 pistols, you've got a month. Like by the time the rifles are all produced, we need to have 50 pistols. And each individual uh, craftsman, machinist, would make one pistol from start to finish and then make a second one start to finish. And there was no consideration for having parts interchangeable or magazines interchangeable because it wasn't really seen as necessary. Um, some of these guns are very high quality. Some of them are very low quality. They really run the gamut there because they're all being individually produced by individual people. And that translates down to the decorative elements on a gun, um, the exact shaping. They're, what I've been able to do looking at several hundred of these guns is narrow them down into a number of uh, stereotypical design styles where the mechanics and and some of the basic aesthetic features are obviously all from the same time and place. And while I have very little information on what those times and places were, you can tell that they were made in the same mold, shall we say. Uh, but what's fascinating is even then, no two pistols are identical. So I have one great example that are a pair of sequentially numbered, and these appear to be legitimate serial numbers, which they aren't always on these guns, but a pair of sequentially numbered uh, pistols that are almost identical. But when you start looking at the fine details, they're not, they're different. And it is because they were made by two different people on the same basic design. So it's a fascinating topic. I'm really excited to have the book done. Um, hope to have it out this spring. So thanks for asking about that, Patrick. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. Let's see. 6.8 millimeter experimental cartridges. I, um, Adam, I really don't know that much in detail about. Not enough to, to be speaking at length. Um, do you think developing guns on your army service has more potential... Not sure exactly what that question is. Um, Adam asks, is there any truth to the, the hearsay that the very early versions of the SKS saw action against the Germans in the spring of 45? As best I've been able to tell, they did not. Um, the person to speak with on that would be Max Popienko. Um, but yeah, the, the SKS was not in service. It's there are a number of U.S. weapons that were also like just on the cusp of, of introduction, and German ones too, for that matter. Um, but the SKS was not in the Battle of Berlin. Ooh, here, yes. Uh, do I have a favorite historical era when it comes to looking at guns? Yes, I have two that I think have the most interesting stuff, and they are the period of transition from single shot to repeating uh, firearms, and that would be 1870s through 1890s or so, uh, 1870s, 1880s. Because, well, and the second one would be the transition from manual repeating actions to self-loading actions, which is going to be similar. Basically, as soon as smokeless powder was developed, so 
late 1880s through about 1900 and the 1910s. The reason that I find those two so fascinating is they are fundamental leaps in technology where nobody really knows what the best um, solutions are going to be. Like, what is the best way to design a magazine for a bolt action rifle? And as people start coming up with ideas, they start patenting them. And uh, patents are, are limited time legal instruments. A patent will last typically something like 17 years. And so in this very early period, the good ideas get patented fairly quickly, but there's still a lot of people who think they have uh, a workable idea and who are very much interested in trying to get in on the, the new technology and market a product. And so you start to see this huge flowering of really weird conceptual ideas. Uh, and because you can't just copy the best one that gets patented and then you have to wait 17 years until the patent expires before you can just make that one. And so that's where you'll see hopper feeds and tube feeds and, you know, side saddle magazines and all sorts of really weird stuff. When it comes to semi-autos, that's where you get the inertial delayed systems and blow forward systems. And again, all sorts of unusual twists. And most of them don't work. They leave us with these artifacts of things that are, you, just fascinating mechanically to look at because they're all sort of workarounds of, well, that solution seemed to be the best one, but we can't use it because Browning, and it's often Browning, already patented it. So what do we do instead? Um, and then once, once people figure out what works best and once the patents expire, then everyone just focuses on that solution and you get things like Browning tilting barrel pistols, which are not the only style of self-loading pistol out there, but they are by far the predominant one. And we don't get blow forward pistols and long act, long, uh, long recoil pistols and that sort of thing anymore. Do I see a resurgence of historical firearms from the prolifer proliferation of metal 3D printing? Um, basically the greater avail, well, from greater availability of replacement parts, uh, to maybe complete guns. Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, the advent of 3D modeling and 3D printing makes it possible. The question is going to be whether there's really adequate demand because when it comes to complete guns, you're gonna run into the same problems that you have with traditional manufacturing techniques. And in some ways you may have additional problems. The most efficient way to make a reproduction is typically going to be the same way that it was made originally. And maybe you can update it a little bit by using a CNC machine instead of a, you know, a traditional manually operated machine, uh, but you're going to be doing the same operations. So you're not changing from, you know, a manual drill press to a CNC lathe. You're going to go from a manual drill to a computer controlled drill. If you try to make those parts using additive um, manufacturing, using 3D printing, there's a, a real potential, I think, to have things get more complicated and not really save any time. And then the final product still has those reliability issues that I talked about earlier of it has to work pretty much perfectly or your market is going to reject it. Um, and there's only a certain amount of, it, you're, you're balancing how much it's going to cost to be able to do this and make a profit on it versus what is your market willing to pay for something that in the case of a reproduction, is pretty much by definition a luxury item. Um, it's not something that anyone actually really needs, it's something that they want. And that I think tends to temper the price that people are willing to pay for it. Parts are maybe a different issue, but the market for specific parts is going to be even smaller than the market for complete guns, um, especially uh, Keith brought up specifically machine gun parts. Well, that's a tiny market to begin with. And so I don't know that it will be that much easier to find someone willing to put in the R&D time to, uh, you know, to do the, the drawings and the, the preparation work for, you know, something that they're going to sell a dozen of. Hopefully, maybe, um, the 3D printing does add some opportunities for us, but uh, I, I wouldn't call it a sure thing. I'd be cautiously optimistic about it happening. Let's see. <laughs> uh, 
Misty has an interesting question that I don't have a good answer to, but it's one that's that's worth following up on. Um, you have a favorite historical figure or person that you found particularly entertaining during your research. There are definitely some. Um, I haven't had as much time to dig into specific personalities as I would like, um, but there's some, you can talk to Othias at CNR Sola about Sam Colt and uh, he'll tell you some interesting stories. Uh, and there's some really cool little anecdotes. I know um, one of the things that Ashley shared with us was the the infamous sour grapes letter from Winchester. You want to mention that, Ashley? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, it's like, it's so good. Um, it's a letter from Thomas Bennett, uh, who ran Winchester. Fantastic character in, in firearms history, uh, two salesmen and missionaries about the uh, breakup of Winchester with Browning. And it basically, I mean, it, it talks about the fact that like, you know, Winchester's gonna do great without Browning, but he calls Matthew Browning uh, a difficult proposition, which is a direct quote. And he goes on to say that, you know, well, we have a, you know, semi-automatic technology is not that cool. And, you know, we've already got ours and, you know, something more in the works. So it's not a big deal that we lost him. And he says that, you know, Winchester will do just fine without Browning. Um, and I, I can't say the same for Browning without Winchester. And it's just, it's the, I mean, it, it was, as we know, that didn't exactly play out so well for Winchester. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a sour grapes letter. If you come to the museum, we actually have a copy of it on display in the Browning store. It's so good. Uh, one of the other interesting ones that I've done a little bit more reading into is um, the, the M1 carbine and carbine Williams, who had a hand in it, but when you look at the people around him talking about his contributions to the, the company and the gun, it's much more about how incredibly difficult he was to work with and how it wasn't so much, development of the M1 carbine wasn't so much carbine Williams presents this fantastic thing, it's how do we deal with him and still produce a good gun at the same time? Oh. Oh, you uh, have to answer the William Cantello one. Sorry, I just saw it pass through. And if Jonathan Ferguson is uh, on, uh, he can speak to that. <laughs> I would defer to Jonathan if he's here because I, I recall the name, but I don't remember the story well enough to repeat it. Hey, Jonathan, can you, can you tell the William Cantello story? Uh, I can, bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to write in the chat, uh, the technical term for that is a load of old bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll, try and, uh, I'll try, try and summarize it in a slightly more scholarly fashion. Uh, <laughs> I think I came across this when BBC Radio 4 got in touch, uh, saying that <laughs> they were in touch with a descendant of Mr. Cantello, uh, who was absolutely convinced that it's, it's really bizarre, but <laughs> uh, that uh, Maxim <laughs> essentially mistaken identity, or they, he, he's, basically it's a conspiracy theory is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I was trying to tell it in a reasonable way, but I can't. <laughs> the, the story is that this ancestor who lived in the south of England was the real inventor of the Maxim machine gun and happened to look exactly like him <laughs> and then disappeared mysteriously. And I don't want to be uh, unsuparative to Barry Cantello because I've spoken to him and he's a nice chap. It really sounds like the guy was a deadbeat dad and just left the family and this story was cooked up to kind of explain it. Uh, because, because this Cantello was working on quote unquote, a machine gun in a basement, which is an interesting proposition with a black powder machine gun. Uh, so long, long story, slightly shorter, there's no evidence of such a machine gun or rapid fire gun being made by a Cantello. And Cantello is definitely not Maxim. Maxim may have ripped off other people's designs, but um, yeah, not this one. Uh, Danny just texted me and says, <laughs> there was Cantello. <laughs> Um, also, I think my favorite part of that story when Danny and I discovered it was that like the, the according to the story, and Jonathan, you can say if that actually happened or not, if you know, but according to the story, um, the kids of William Cantello like tracked Maxim down and like 
ran and like saw him at like a train station and they were like yep. Dad! and he was like what that's that's the story that made me think that it was if if it's true in any way then it's a rather sad family story <laughs> as i'm laughing about it well yeah it's funny tragic tragic comic i guess <laughs> sorry little sidebar that story is just one of the one of the greats that Danny and I uncovered when we were right in the new museum. I love it. I mean, it's possible the Radio 4 store, uh, broadcast is still online, I think, maybe, if people want to look. I'll put it in the chat. I'll have a look. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> Back to Ian. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Kyle Barrett asked one that, it's a question that I've seen come up quite a bit um over a while and that is is there a technology from one, one of these two eras that i mentioned that got stymied somehow and should have become more mainstream and well there may be one or two small exceptions that i can't think of off the top of my head that the answer is no the answer is over time um the marketplace finds the best solutions and there are going to be it, it's not going to be a perfect you know bell curve sort of chain of adoption because you're going to have places where a large, say a large military makes a decision and, and adopts something that isn't the best um, and perhaps adopts it over a better design for reasons of any any number of reasons. It could be cost, it could be we want to, something designed by one of our, our own national designers, we want something that we can make um, here in our country. You know, the reason Germany didn't adopt the FAL is because Belgium wasn't willing to license it uh, for production in Germany. Can't imagine why, but um, over time, the good designs, the good mechanical systems will always and have always come through. So there isn't like this lost hidden gem of a firearm uh, that that would have been, could have, should have, but wasn't and will and has disappeared forever. When that sort of thing happens, and I think one of the best examples that I'm personally aware of is the Schwarzlos 1898 pistol, which is a pretty darn good pistol, but all of the elements that are good about it showed up later as well. It's not like, you know, they were on that gun in 1898 and it was lost and didn't become successful uh, and then they never come back. No, they all came back. Um, the reason that we consider it a remarkably good modern gun is because it's got the same elements that we have today, um, many of the same elements. So uh, Yuval, um, tell me if I'm getting this right. The, uh, the question is, uh, is it better to develop a military weapon and then adopt it to the civilian market or better to develop a civilian weapon and then adopt it to the military market? And <laughs> there's a lot of maybes and what ifs in that kind of question. Um, from the perspective of the company doing the development, I would say it's at least historically, it's safer to develop something for the commercial market because it's an easier market to sell to. Um, you're selling to a lot of individual people and if you lose a few of them, not really the biggest deal. Like Winchester didn't have to, have to sell a lever action to every single person who wanted a lever action. It was okay if some of them bought Marlins and some of them decided that they didn't want a lever action at all where with a military contract, it really generally is a winner take all thing. And so if you develop a system specifically for the military and then you lose the trial, and man, people, companies have lost military trials for some of the stupidest reasons you can believe. Um, one that comes to mind uh, offhand is the Che Rigotti, which the British tested. The Italians shipped over like a couple of guns and a bunch of ammo for them and the ammo got waterlogged en route shows up, gun doesn't work at all because all the ammo is ruined. And that was the end of the trials on the Che Rigotti. Hopefully I got that right and Nick won't correct me on it. But um, that there are plenty of other other times when say a gun gets uh, the Luger rifle in um, trials, I wanna say in the US, was simply not, not, not um, presented in the proper caliber. Like correct bore diameter, not their correct cartridge, out of the, out of the competition. So if you put five or eight or 10 years of development work into a firearm only to lose it for some stupid reason like that, or because your gun is one and a half percent more expensive than one of your competitors and it comes down to cost, 
then that's a really good way to take a big company with a lot of investment capital and go completely bankrupt. The risk on the other side is that the military isn't going to be interested in the gun that you develop for the civilian market. Maybe it ends up being too late. Um, maybe, maybe you lose the contract for kind of a stupid reason. But at that point, you at least have, have some sales that you can fall back on. Um, now, that's not to say that this is always the case. Um, FN had a couple of guns that it developed specifically for the Belgian army, and the plan was to use an army contract uh, to pay for all the tooling and development, and then basically have it free and clear to sell for a nice good market on the civilian side. Um, the FN 1903 is an example of that. The FN 1900, 1899-1900, uh, was first sold to the Belgian military. So it can go both ways, but I think it's a lot safer to develop something for the civilian market. Now, when you bring that into the present day, a gun developed for the civilian market may not meet any sort of you know, requirement for a military user, um, because you're not going to be developing a squad automatic weapon for the civilian market because you can't sell it to the civilian market. So that puts kind of like we discussed earlier, that puts companies in this strange place of what is your backup plan if you're trying to develop military machine guns and you don't win a contract? What is my opinion on counterbalanced recoil systems? I would love to try one. I have yet to have uh, the opportunity to actually shoot any of the, the counterbalanced um, recoil operation guns. I know one or two people who have who tell me they're very impressive. Um, but kind of gets back to what we what I just talked about, that they're machine guns. And so they're very difficult to get uh, from outside of the US here, hopefully someday. Let's see. Um, Arnold asked privately, do you see a growing role for electronics and firearms, digital triggers, uh, range compensation, target tracking, and, and so on, or so-called personalization? Yes, I think there's a lot of stuff that's going to be developed there. I don't think any of it is going to be really fundamental um, in terms of changing guns as we know them, but this is one of those areas where you can change sort of the, the external characteristics of a gun a lot. Uh, and particularly with optics, we're already seeing some things with, uh, say, optics that have programmable reticles where you can, uh, let's say you have a hunting rifle and you've got the, you know, the, the really expensive expanding soft tipped ammunition that you want to use for hunting, but you want to use cheaper ammunition to just go out and practice. Um, and maybe those two cartridges don't have the exact same trajectory. Well, there are already starting to be some optics out there where you can program uh, this is my reticle for this cartridge, and then I can just, with a hit of push of a button, I can change it to this pre-programmed reticle for this cartridge that can have different um, elevation marks in them. Um, we've certainly seen the opportunity for, with, with simpler systems where you can have a red dot that has multiple different styles of optic that you can change between, or even colors, potentially. Um, we've seen some development of tracking point, the idea of automatic range adjustment in an optic where you have a laser rangefinder built in and just you know you, you laser the target it tells you the range and then automatically compensates for the elevation i think that's a really cool system that is like it's, it's kind of the equivalent of the backpack sized early cell phones where it's actually not that useful by itself but early adopters who are into it will fund better developments that will actually be useful the problem i see in something like tracking point is that Adjusting for range and elevation is the easy part. The hard part is windage. And both measuring measuring wind, not just where you are, but also where the target is, and if the range is long enough, everywhere in between, uh, what angle is it coming in at, what velocity is it coming in at, and then uh, making a wind call. And that's something that we don't have uh, a computerized system built into any optics yet. It may come yet, um, that's a more difficult technical problem to solve because there's a lot of measuring that has to go into it. But um, triggers, I'm kind of of two minds. Uh, I think the biggest thing that is holding back electronic triggers, well, there are going to be two. One is sort of the, the very old school uh, lack of trust in electronic systems in firearms. There are people 
uh, who will simply not trust an electronic trigger. Maybe rightly, probably not. Um, there have been a couple of electronic trigger and electronic primered firearms out there that have been pretty much flops for that reason. On self-loading rifles, I think there's a, a very legitimate concern that such things would be considered easily convertible into machine guns. You know, if it's a matter of all you have to do is like flash a new operating, you know, a, a new set of commands into your trigger and all of a sudden you have a machine gun, um, that's something that's going to have legislative or uh, regulatory implications. And so I suspect without any basis, I haven't talked to anybody in the industry about this, but I suspect that is holding back serious development of electronic triggers. Now, if you have manually operated firearms, that's certainly something uh, where it would be applicable. Uh, and in that case, I suspect what's holding it back is a lot of uh, the, the rule sets of competitions where those would be most useful that have specific limitations for trigger weight or for trigger mechanism that um, either don't allow electronic triggers or, or allow them in such a way that they're not actually any better than mechanical triggers. Nick has a good point here that um, cost, that, that size and bulk and cost are a, a limiting factor in some of those more complex and cool optics for the time being. You're right, um, but that will, technology is always getting cheaper and smaller. Um, and so I don't think that'll hold, hold stuff back all that long. I think we'll see some cool development, particularly in optics. Uh, Tim asked about the Giordoni rifle. I have handled them, but I've never actually shot one. So I really speak to that. Ah, what rifle could replace the M4 currently in service? I don't, I haven't seen one that can. Um, I think the, the, the rifle in service right now was a darn good design to begin with that has been tremendously improved by what 60 years now of continuous iteration and development and improvement and i think it's almost short of finding some fundamental change in technology the sort of you know the the black powder to smokeless powder the flintlock to the percussion cap uh the percussion cap to the self-contained metallic cartridge short of a fundamental improvement like that I don't see any rifle that can effectively replace the M4 um, because there are a few that offer small improvements in specific areas, but they do so without the reliability that comes from 60 years of development, uh, as well as the cost. So we've had, there's so much manufacture of AR-15s and their derivatives that the, the economy of scale is tremendous. It's gonna be extremely difficult to outbid an AR platform rifle for the military on any sort of bulk purchase. And it's going to be extremely difficult to make something that is more reliable. Because while even if, even if a gun has the potential to be more reliable, you need to do now not five years of development to get it pretty good before you present it to the military. Now you need to do like 20 years and deploy millions of them to every environment on the planet to find all of those little small flaws that can only be found through trial and error and experience and somehow develop all that into the gun before you get to the step of convincing the military to buy it. And I just don't see that happening. Um, the closest thing we might have are changes in caliber. Um, someone else was talking about some of the experimental 6.8 millimeter cartridges or 6.5 millimeter cartridges. Even that sort of thing, I would be very dubious about a military actually adopting um, because there is so much logistical overhead already in 5.56. And the new cartridges, while they may be better in some applications, uh, they're always compromises and trade-offs. And they don't seem to me to be fundamentally better in any way that would justify you know, large-scale replacement. Uh, which bullpup of the ones that the U.S. is trialing? I don't think... Yeah, the NGSW, the next generation uh, weapons, I would be very surprised if any of those get adopted. The US has a, a long and glorious history of holding a trial and adopting nothing. Yes, like the XM8, exactly. Uh, <laughs> what rifle couldn't uh, replace the SA-80? Uh, Jonathan, what rifle could replace the SA-80? 
Oh, God. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, any rifle? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Well, yes, but no. <laughs> <laughs> it's unfair because I'm left-handed, but I would take, like, a 1960s AK over an SA-80. Uh, well, it, it, it depends when we're asking the question, doesn't it? If we're, if we're asking when it first emerged and it became <laughs> obvious that it was not very good, the answer is M16A2, or a little bit later, G36, um, which is almost the same thing as saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you, oh, I don't know. Um, in terms of now, the, it's been, you know, fettled to the point where it's fine and it can be kept going almost indefinitely if people, it's, it's like having an old car, isn't it? You know, you, you can keep that thing going until you die if you want to put the money in question if, is do they do they want to put the money in <laughs> yeah to be fair to the sa80 the the a2 and a3 are really perfectly fine firearm systems now um they yeah, have a perfectly new, fine is absolutely the best <laughs> thing you can say <laughs> they have a, a few shortcomings that are holdovers from the original design like they can't be ambidextrous and they're a little little bit on the heavy side but all, all, all else being fair, it's it's not a terrible gun anymore, like it was. Um, uh, so we've got a few more minutes. So Ian, why don't you answer one more question, and then we will move on to the Ford's Theater. All right. All right, so with military trials that are considered expensive failures like the ACR and the SPU, is the truth that the state of the art is it is advanced and we will see those advances uh, sold and or deployed just later rather than sooner and we have to be patient? Sort of. I think in a lot of these cases what's happening is the military is funding R&D and they're saying we want to see your best shot at this unattainable goal and kind of uh, probably often knowing that or expecting that nothing will actually be developed. And those technologies may not, it, it, some of them may be uh, adopted later on, but sometimes it's worth the money and you have to actually do the project to discover that something really isn't feasible. Because going in, I think caseless ammo is a really good example. Going into caseless ammo, you can see that there are obstacles and there are problems, but there's no way to know that those problems may not be achieved. You know, you may be able to overcome those problems or you may not, but you can't really predict which way that's going to go until you actually try it on a large enough scale um, to, to really know. And I think that's a lot of what we saw with guns like the G11 and sort of the hyper burst mechanisms of, is it going to be, can we work out the problems with this? Well, let's make, let's spend 15 years and find out. And if the answer is no, then it gives us valuable information with which to direct future development efforts. Because if no one ever tried it on a large scale and people just keep hammering at this problem on a small scale, you'll always have that existing question of, well, maybe they just didn't try it right. So let's, let's keep working along this line of reasoning where if you, if you do give it the full try and discover that no, these problems really are fairly fundamental and, and unfixable, then we can scrap that whole thing and focus on stuff that's more likely to work. So sometimes the, the technology will, will proceed to a point where it's usable um, and sometimes it won't, but they're both valuable. All right, well, thank you, Ian. I'm sure there's a million more questions. So feel free to answer them in the chat if, <laughs> <laughs> if you're still around. <laughs> now I'm going to actually go get my lunch. Uh, oh. I, I will see if I can answer some messages in chat while I uh, enjoy some lunch and enjoy the next presentation.